well today. Uh, my name is Pastor Tiffany, and my husband Elliot and I have the great honor of pastoring this group of people called Lifeline Church. So happy to be with you t- uh, today. We were actually on vacation for the last, uh, for a week. Yeah, thanks. Um, in Alaska, I think some of you guys probably saw the pictures, but we came back, and this is our first Sunday back. It's always good to get away, but it's so, so, so much fun to be back with church family and just in the groove and, and doing life. So if this is one of your first or second times here, I just want to say welcome. So glad you're here. We truly do believe that God has a message of love, hope, and encouragement for you today. Uh, we're not in a series this month. We're normally in a series, but we're doing random things, which I think is so much fun. I love random and awkward, all things good. Uh, this isn't going to be awkward. It's just going to be good. <laughs> uh, but to, uh, if you care about titles, the title of this message today is called Encounter. Uh, so you guys can go ahead and I'll give you time to turn in your scripture. If you have your paper Bible, you can open to chapter the book of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 14. We're going to read out of there. That's also going to be up on the screens if you don't have uh, a Bible, so that's perfectly okay. And then we are on the YouVersion Bible app, which you can pull up on there as well. Uh, but before we jump into the scripture, I just want to talk for a little bit about technology. How many of you guys in here have a cell phone? Like everybody. <laughs> Even if you're 10, which is crazy. Um, okay, so technology. So we live in a day and age of technology. And with technology comes rapid change. How many, okay, I'm one of those people who get extremely irritated every time my phone has to update. <gasps> or the computer. I turned my computer on the other day to do work and literally for a whole hour I was watching it update and I was like, well, there goes the one nap hour I had to get work done. <laughs> Thank you, technology. But well, we live in, the, in a day and age of technology and rapid change. So people on tech, I don't know why they think it's necessary to update things every two weeks. Like, really? Really? Really, I don't. It's kind of irritating. Uh, but what I was thinking about this, I, sometimes my hair, I'm so sorry. Uh, with the rapid technology and the change, it's almost as if there's no anchor in our lives. Uh, there's nothing to hold on to because everything seems so fleeting. You know, when the holidays come around and you're like, man, I can't believe it's 4th of July. We just had New Year's. You know, like time is just flying and it's fleeting. And so I think now more than ever, uh, we're talking about this idea of encounter, encountering the Lord. Uh, because those moments when we encounter God, they, they, they act as an anchor in our life, keeping us grounded in what God has said of us and what God has said for us. So that no matter what change happens around us, you know, all the fleeting and the time, we are anchored in who God has said that we are. But that doesn't happen unless we have an encounter with him. And so that's what I want to talk about today. And it's not just one encounter, but multiple encounters. It's possible to have more than one encounter with God in your life. And it's important that that happens. And so I want to turn to the scripture because in scripture we can see people encountering God, and then how they reacted to him. So that's uh, what I want to do today. So in 1 Samuel chapter 14, I hope that you are there. I'm going to be reading verses 24 through 35. It's kind of a big chunk, but scripture is good, so let's do it. Uh, Now, just to set this up, uh, this is when King Saul is, this is before King David. This is King Saul. He's the first king of Israel, and they are in battle with the Philistines. Okay, so we're entering into the middle of a battle scene right here with King Saul. Now it says that now the Israelites were in distress that day because Saul had bound the people under an oath saying, cursed be anyone who eats food before evening comes before I have avenged myself on my enemies. So none of the troops tasted food. The entire army entered the woods and there was honey on the ground. When they went into the woods, they saw the honey oozing out. Yet no one put his hand to his mouth because they feared the oath. But Jonathan had not heard that his father had bound the people with the oath. So he reached out the end of his staff that was in his hand and dipped it into the honeycomb. He raised his hand to his mouth and his eyes brightened. Then one of the soldiers told him, Your father bound the army under a strict oath, saying, Cursed be anyone who eats food today. That is why the men are faint. Jonathan said, My father has made trouble for the country. See how my eyes brightened when I tasted a little of this honey? How much better would it have been if the men had eaten today some of the plunder they took from their enemies? Would not the slaughter of the Philistines have been even greater? 
That day, after the Philistines had struck down the after the Israelites had struck down the Philistines from Michmash to Ijalon, they were exhausted. They pounced on the plunder and, taking sheep, cattle, and calves, they butchered them on the ground and ate them together with the blood. Then someone said to Saul, "Look, the men are sinning against the Lord by eating meat that has blood in it. You have broken faith," he said. Roll a large stone over here at once. And then he said, Go out among the men and tell them, Each of you bring me your cattle and sheep and slaughter them here and eat them. Do not sin against the Lord by eating meat with blood still in it. So everyone brought his ox that night and slaughtered it there. Then Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first time he had done this. So I read that whole passage, but really what struck me is that very last line that says, Then Saul built an an altar to the Lord. It was the first time he had done this. And it's significant that the Lord mentions it being the first time Saul built an altar. So let me briefly describe the purpose of an altar. So an altar is something that stands as a place of remembrance. God, what would happen is God would meet with people and then the people would mark that place as a reminder that they had met with God, that God had come and met with them and spoke with them. And so in the Old Testament, uh, an altar was a place where they would pile up stones. They would create a bed of earth a little bit raised up so that they could offer a sacrifice. They could offer an animal. And an animal was something valuable to them. It was their food. So they'd take a choice animal, one that was good for dinner, and they would sacrifice it there because God had met with them. They marked that place. They remembered that place. And then what would happen is that pile of earth, that altar would remain there. So any time they passed back by that place, they would see it, and they would remember God spoke to me there. God gave me a word there. I encountered God there. And so the altar stood as a place of remembrance. It was, it was a marker. I have met with God. I have been transformed by God. Um, and so very simply, we could say an altar is a place of acknowledgement and transformation. It is the beginning of a relationship with God. And so it says here that this was the first time Saul built an altar. And that's significant because... By this time, Saul has already been king for at least a few years. And it's the first time that he stopped to acknowledge God. Let me run down his history for you because I was like, seriously? I was kind of in shock at how ignorant this, this guy. I mean, he's, he was the king, so I'm going to give him honor because he was the king of Israel. But come on! Okay, so this is, this is Saul's history. Saul, he was 30, but I guess that was like a young man, a youth. Can you imagine me in a street youth until you're 30? Okay, so he's 30 years old, and his father's donkeys are missing. So he goes, his father sends him out to look for the missing donkeys, and he brings along a companion. They're out wandering around, and they can't find the donkeys. And so his friend says, hey, Samuel the prophet, let's go find Samuel the prophet. A prophet is the guy who just speaks to the people on behalf of God. God, maybe God will tell him where the donkeys are, and we can go find the donkeys. And so Saul's like, okay, let's go find him. So they stop looking for the donkeys. They go look for this prophet named Samuel. While that's taking place, God is over here speaking to the prophet Samuel. And God tells the prophet Samuel, there's a man out looking for donkeys. I know where the donkeys are, but the, the people of Israel have been asking for a king. And this guy Saul, I want you to find him, and I want you to anoint him as the first king of Israel. Okay, so Saul looking for donkeys, and Samuel, who's been told this guy's going to be the king of Israel, they meet. And he finds out where the donkeys are. And then Samuel says to Saul, hey, the nation of, is of Israel has been asking for a king. And God said, you're the man. Okay? So that's random because he's just out looking for donkeys. And all of a sudden he finds out from the prophet that he's going to be the king of Israel. Big deal, right? Okay. So, and then Samuel says to Saul, you're, no, you're going to know this is going to happen because on your way home you're going to run into a group of people prophesying which only happens by the power of God. And so Saul happens upon the group of people, and he starts prophesying with them. Again, big deal, because that only happens by the power of God. And then he makes his way home. He finds the donkey. There's a big celebration. And then Samuel the prophet comes to his very own town, his very own home, and in front of all of his relatives, the, the Benjamites is who they were, the, the prophet Samuel comes and anoints Saul, the very first king of Israel. Big deal. And then these people, so he's anointed the king of Israel, and then these people called the Ammonites come and try and invade the land. And so newly appointed King Saul summons 330,000 Israelites to come destroy the Ammonites, and they're successful. They defeat the Ammonites, and they get to keep the land. Big deal. 
okay? And then his son Jonathan, who we just read about, he goes and strikes up a, a battle of war with the Philistines. And so we enter the scene. They're in the middle of battle with the Philistines who they've defeated, and then, you know, they're going back and forth. And then Saul builds an altar. Okay, so this is, let me explain this. There were so many divine appointments in Saul's life up to this point, yet he doesn't recognize God in any of them. This is huge. He does not honor God when Samuel tells him he's going to be king. There was, if someone came to you and told you you were going to be president or king or whatever big, you know, when you, uh, in your viewpoint, in your lens, someone who's big and mighty and in a place of authority that maybe you desire to be in, if someone were to come and tell you God has seen you, God has chosen you, and he's putting you in that place, would you not bow down before the Lord in worship? Because that's a big deal. God saw he, nothing. He doesn't, he doesn't build an altar. He doesn't honor God there. He doesn't honor God when he begins to prophesy with those prophets. That was an act of God in his life, and he didn't stop to honor God. He doesn't honor God when he's actually anointed king. When the actual anointing takes place, he's hiding, and he, and he barely comes out. And then he comes out, but he's like, he's not transformed by God. It's so strange. And then it's only after his second victory when he made a poor judgment call, someone brings it to attention like, hey, you made a bad call, and now the people are sinning. It is there in that moment that he decides to build an altar. And good thing, because he repented before the Lord. But it was a little bit late. It was a little bit late. And all the events recorded in Saul's life are good. Good things happened. Nothing bad happened in Saul's life up to this point. Everything in his life was good and perfect. He had nothing to complain about, yet he had nothing to praise God for. He thought, have you ever been there? Or can you think of times where your life is good, but it's like we're not, we can't find a reason to give God praise? Um, when, I, when I read about that, what I did in my heart and my mind was I contrasted his response to the Lord with others who have gone before him. So there was Saul who had everything good happen in his life, yet he never built an altar. He never recognized God. There was never a place where he could walk by and remember, oh, yeah, I met with God there. That hadn't happened in his heart, even though God had appeared in his life. Okay? But <laughs> there you go. Uh, but but so let, I want to show you three other people, and I want to show you their response to the Lord. Because when we read Scripture, we can respond like Saul did, or we can choose a different response. So Noah, maybe you've heard about him. He's the guy who God told to build an ark. I'm going to destroy the world. <gasps> Yikes. Uh, that's in Genesis 8, verse 18 through 21. It says this. Noah came out of the ark together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives. All the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds. Everything that moves on land came out of the ark, one kind after another. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. And taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. So I'm going to break this down. God spoke to Noah. Noah took a risk and obeyed what he thought he heard God say. God ended up being faithful, and then Noah built an altar. He made a place of remembrance. I have met with God here. God did what he has promised. God is faithful. Every time he walked by that place, he would remember, my God is faithful. Okay? And then God made a covenant there with Noah. That was the rainbow. And that, so let's read about Abraham. Abraham's another guy who built an altar, and we can follow his example. That's in Genesis chapter 12, verse 4 through 7. He's the father of the Israelites. So, Abra so this is before he was renamed Abraham. His real name's Abram. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot, his nephew, went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So again, let's break this down. God spoke to Abram. Abram took a risk and obeyed what he thought God said. 
God met Abram and gave him a promise, and then Abram built an altar. And that specific altar was an altar of praise. He said, thank you, God, and he praised him there. In fact, Abraham, if you read about him, he built four altars in his life. He built an altar of praise. That's the one we just read about. He built an altar of prayer. There was a time in his life where he was desperate for God to show up, and so he built an altar of prayer, and God showed up and met him. So every time Abraham passed by that place, he would remember, my God answers prayer. Because he built an altar. Something had happened in his heart. Something had happened in his life. And then he built an altar of uh, peace. There was war and something. there was uh, hostility going on. And then God showed up and he brought peace. And so every time Abraham pa- passed by that place, he knew my God is a God of peace. My God will show up and my God will come to my defense. And he also built an altar of provision. God provided and he built an altar. And then there's one other guy I want to read about. His name is Jacob. Uh, That's in Genesis chapter 28, verse 10 through 2, and it says this, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. So break it down again. Uh, Jacob If you guys remember the story, it's Jacob and Esau. Jacob had just stolen his brother's inheritance. Isaac blessed him instead of his brother, and so Esau wanted to kill him. Jacob was running for his life. He ran away from his family. He ran away from his home because his brother was going to kill him. And God met Jacob in that dark place. Now, here's what's interesting. Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, had known God. Jacob's father, Isaac, had known God. But Jacob had not yet met God. Jacob did not know God. He had heard of God, but he had never had an encounter with God. God was not the God of Jacob. He was the God of Abraham, and he was the God of Isaac. But Jacob hadn't made a decision for the Lord. And so in that dark place, God met with Jacob, and Jacob said, Okay. I'll believe you. I'll trust you. And he didn't build an altar, but he set up a pillar. It was still a marker. It was a place of remembrance. The God of my grandfather and the God of my father has become my God today. He has met with me, and I have met with him. So I want to go back really quickly to that person, Saul, the king Saul. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, 23, it, this is what it says of Saul, the guy who didn't honor God, the guy who, who didn't think that he had anything worth praising God for in his life. This is what God tells him. Rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, I have rejected you as king. Because you have refused to acknowledge my work in your life, I have rejected you as king. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 13, 14, we see that this is Saul's death and we see that he died tragically and scripture records he died tragically because he was unfaithful to the lord and disobedient he did not trust god and god had set him up as the king of israel and he said you cannot rule my people if you will not trust me whoosh gosh that stuff is deep and so when i was reading that i was like man i don't want to be like saul i don't want to live my life seeing the hand of god at work but never giving him praise Never having a marker where I can walk back and say, my God did this for me here. A a place of transformation, a a developed relationship with the Lord. And an altar, that 
that encounter, that altar, it's not just a one-time thing. We should have multiple encounters in our life with the living God. Because it's at the altar where, where that transformation in our heart takes place. Uh, so instead, we should desire to be like Noah, who, who took a risk. He heard God. He did something crazy. Abraham, he heard God at age 75, and he did something crazy. Uh, Jacob, who was running from his life, and he met God there, and his whole life was transformed. These are the people we should desire to be like. We're in the quiet places of our heart and of our life. We encounter God, and we allow him to bring transformation. There's, let's make this New Testament, because you're like, I'm not going to build an altar of earth. It's not going to happen. not going to pile up the stones in your backyard and sacrifice your dog. <laughs> or your cat. We have a cat. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I love my cat. <laughs> but there's, there's New <laughs> Let's get New Testament, okay? Uh, Matthew 19, 23 through 29. This is Jesus. And let's look at Peter and John, okay? This is how Peter and John respond and build an altar. Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. So physically, Peter and John never built an altar. That, that, that time was kind of over. Uh, but what they did do is they surrendered at the altar of their heart. Peter says, I've left everything to follow you. What is there going to be for me? And Jesus answers and he says, a hundred times what you left is waiting for you. Much like Noah, Abraham, and Jacob who left the familiar for the unknown to pursue a promise of God, Peter and John did the same thing. They left their career. They were fishermen. They left their entire career behind and providing for their family in order to follow Jesus. And they trusted that Jesus would provide. They had built an altar in their heart. They had been transformed. There was a marker. There was a place they could go back to. They remembered when Jesus had called them. And so when things got rough, everything, you know, they had to update their phone and, and things were changing and transforming in their life and nothing seemed stable. They could go back to that moment in their heart and in their mind and they knew I chose to follow Jesus and a hundred times more is waiting for me. Something had happened. There was a marker in their life. And so the question is, how do you build an altar in your own life? Or how do you know if you had an experience worth an altar to be built? Maybe you've had an experience, but you didn't build an altar. Or you had an experience, but you can't walk by and remember it. Or you haven't gone back to it. That's important. Maybe you've had the experience, but you haven't gone back. It's important to go back and to remember what God has spoken of you, what God has said for you, and where God wants to take you. So very simply, I, I feel like the easiest way for me to do this, I'm going to share three experiences in my life where they, they were altar experiences. They were encounters with God. And my prayer is that as I share these experiences, you will remember the moments that you've had with God so you can go back and either give God praise or pick up the action that he told you to take on. Okay, that's huge. So uh, these, are, these are my moments. Are you ready for my moments? Yeah. There they go. They're so exciting. Whew. Because <laughs> my life is so exciting. <sighs> yeah. Okay, here we go. At age 12, this is my first encounter with God. I was age 12. And this is the moment of my salvation. Uh, God met me. This is how it happened. God met me at a Christian event, and he said to me, this is what God said to me. He said, you are right, Tiff. As you suspected, there is more to me than you have seen, and I invite you to follow me. 
What had happened was, is I grew up in the church and I knew about Jesus and I loved Jesus, but I was certain there was more of Jesus than I had been seeing. I was certain there was more to this God than I'd been hearing about, that I'd been serving, and I wanted more. I wanted everything that Jesus was. I wanted to know him, and it was in the quiet places of my heart. Nobody knew that. Those are just things I desired, and so at a Christian event, I encountered God. He found me there. I was ready to hear him, and that's what he said. You're right. There's more, and I want to show you. And so what I did in that moment is I gave him my whole heart, and I gave him my whole life, and I decided to pursue him. I decided to know him. I decided to serve him. That was, that was encounter number one. I can go back to that place. It is marked in my brain. I can see it clearly. I remember the sounds and the smells. Something happened. It's been marked in my heart. It's been marked in my life. There was a moment of transformation. At age 18, I had another encounter. And this is the moment that God brought me to new expectancy in prayer. Uh, so I was in the middle of a year-long journey to become a missionary in Spain. And the odds at the moment were not in my favor. Uh, nothing was going according to plan. I was working really hard to raise finances to get overseas. And I had a bunch of things I needed to take care of. And mostly what I was hearing was negative comments. People were telling me, it's not going to happen. You're not going to make it yada, 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 yada. It's really hard to keep believing the promise of God when the people in your life are telling you it's not possible. Whew. And so I was like, man, God. So I, I remember I went to the Lord and I was like, okay, what are we going to, what are we going to do here? <laughs> and I was sitting there and the Lord dropped a scripture in my heart that I had never memorized. I did not know this scripture and it was weird. It flashed in my, in my brain, Psalm 37, 4. And I was like, what the heck is that? Let's open up my Bible. So I opened up to Psalm 37, 4, and sure enough, it says this, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. That desire to go to Spain was planted by God because six months earlier, it was the same thing. I was sitting there, and word flashed in my brain, Spain. And I was asking about being a missionary, and so he told me, go to Spain. And so when he brought this up, he said, I planted that desire in your heart, and I will bring it to pass. You believe me, not them. Whew, it was a moment in my life where that journey transformed. It didn't matter in the face of negative comments. I believed that my God was able. And what I did who was I repented for being doubtful. I repented for doubting the promise of God. And I believed in the face of those negative comments that my God was able. I trusted him and I began to do the hard work in faith, believing that God would bring to pass what he had spoken. Because there was a time frame on this. I was believing for a time frame. So that was one encounter. At age 21 is the third encounter I'm going to share with you. And that was the moment that God called me into a life, thank you so much, uh, of him being my provider. Okay, so I was driving home from L.A., and I was talking with the Lord about my future because I was like 20. And when you're 20 in this day and age, should you go to school or should you not go to school? It's like you have to have your whole life mapped out for you because people ask you, what are you going to do with your life? I have no idea. <laughs> so I'm driving, and I had just come home from Spain. So I've been a missionary. I've done some crazy adventure. But now what? Now what am I going to do? With do I stay in the city where I grew up? Do I move? Do I go to college? What do I do? I've got my whole life ahead of me, and I've got to have it figured out right now. Uh, so I was in my car, and I was, I was talking to the Lord about my future, and he met me there in my car while I was driving, and this is what he said to me, I want you to pursue your pastoral license and be ready to plant a church in two years. And I was like, that wasn't on my list. <laughs> that wasn't on my agenda. But what I did in that moment was I thanked God for his plan, and I thanked him that his plans were, are better than mine and that he answers prayer. In that moment, he answered my prayer. And then I did what he said. He said, pursue your pastoral license and be ready to plant a church in two years. So what did I do? I began to pursue that license. I did what he said, and then I let the plan unfold, and the plan is still unfolding, and it hasn't looked like anything like I thought it would. <laughs> nothing, nothing, Hallelujah. nothing, but that's okay. So here's the, here's the point. You need an encounter in your life. You need, an, you need more than one encounter in your life. Maybe you have the salvation encounter where that, that place is marked and you remember you met with God there, but you haven't had any other encounters, and so life seems sort of aimless. And I'm not saying you, you go out and seek an encounter and like be weird about it, but I'm saying you be open to encountering God at whatever phase of life you are in. And then when you meet with him there, you mark that place, and then you go back to it. You need to embrace the pressing in and allow God to lead you to that place of altering. 
And then you need to accept the words that are spoken there by your creator. Because a lot of times what happens is God speaks at that place of encounter, but if you just thank him and walk away the same, what he said isn't going to come to pass in your life. We're going to get there in just a minute. The cross is an altar. Jesus was sacrificed on the cross. And so we can come to God knowing that just as this Jesus has been sacrificed, we can come with thankful hearts for that open door to God. Not just for salvation, but a continual practice of coming to the Lord and thanking him for the things that are taking place in our life. The continual practice of coming to the altar and laying down things we have picked up in exchange for the things that he wishes to give us for the life that he has for us. Each encounter led to an alteration in my life, a lifestyle change. Let me describe that. At age 12, the moment of my salvation, I actually began to read the Bible, and I began to write down my thoughts. If I thought God spoke to me, I wrote it down. As archaic as that may seem. I I took out a pen, I took out a paper, and I wrote it down. I wrote down what I thought God was saying to me. That was a lifestyle change for me. I also began to write down and ask questions or observations about the scripture I was reading. I was reading in the Bible, you know, the book of Judges, and somebody's head got chopped off. Why? If you're a good God, why did you chop his head off? If you're a good God, why? You know what I mean? I asked those hard questions. It's okay to ask hard questions. You don't have to understand it all. Here's the thing. You're not going to understand it all unless you start asking questions. When you start asking questions, those hard questions, and you take them to the Lord, I tell you, he is faithful to answer. He began to, to open my eyes and to see his heart for his people. So when I read hard passages of scripture, I understand the heart of my God. But that didn't happen until I started asking questions. So at that encounter, a lifestyle change took place. I began to engage with the Lord in a way that I had not done before. At age 18, that's the moment where the Lord taught me how to pray better, (laughs) Uh, if that's how you say that. Uh, So I believed the promise of God, and I, I began to declare that over my life. So what happened is I began to take captive thoughts or words that people spoke over spoke over me that set themselves up against what God had spoken. They said it's not possible. And I said, Father, you said it's possible. So I take that thought and I surrender it to you. You are the God who spoke. And so something shifted. That was a lifestyle change. I began to pray better because I believed what my God had said. That was new territory for me. At age 21, that's when God called me to be a pastor, which is crazy. I laid, this is what I did. I laid down my pride of wanting to be like everyone else. At age 20, the last thing I wanted to do is pursue my pastoral license and be ready to plant a church in two years while everyone around me is going to school and getting a college degree. And then they're having a career and then they're being successful. And I'm going to live over here in Flounderland is what that seems like. Okay, because it doesn't seem like there's, there's no clear-cut path in that. It's completely surrendering to the Lord and his will for his people, his church. As a pastor, my call is to serve the church, to release his people, to do the work that he has called them to do. That's not a clear-cut career path with success out there, which is fine. So what I did is I surrendered that, and I began to pick up the life that he had for me. And so here we go. Let's talk about altars. Remember, uh, Abraham built four altars. There was praise, prayer, peace, and provision. I gave God praise. I built an altar of praise when my salvation came. I thanked God that he heard me and that he met me. And I have been transformed by that. I believed God in prayer, and I can pray better because I encountered God and I picked up that lifestyle change. I trusted God's provision when he said, become a pastor. And so in the, no matter what comes my way, I know that my God is faithful. I know that my God is able. I know that my God answers prayer. And I know that my God will provide for me. There is nothing in life that can come against my heart and my soul Because from the inside out, I have been transformed by the living God because of those encounters. If you haven't had an encounter with God, you need one. Salvation is is absolutely a must because that's the invitation for Jesus in your life. But there's a continual encounter. There's a continual relationship with God. Because as life comes your way, you're going to feel like you're floundering if you don't know that your God is able. If you don't know how to come to God in prayer with a boldness and a fierceness in your heart, my God is able. Those moments have shaped me and transformed me. He is worthy of my praise. I can come to him in prayer, and I know that he is my provider. So perhaps you have encountered God, but you didn't know that action was required on your part. 
That's, we're going to get involved here. Perhaps you have received a promise or a directive from God, and you are thankful, but no alteration took place in your life. Nothing changed. That's what happened with Saul. He met God. God talked with him, but nothing changed in his life. And so he died a sad, depressed king. So I want to, this is, here we go. This is the big news. It is at the altar where you are altered. It is at the altar where you are altered. It is in that encounter, in that moment where transformation takes place. Much like Jacob, when the broken things of your life begin to press in around you, if you feel like there are broken things in your life and they're, they're pressing in around you and you feel like fleeing, it is here where God will meet with you and you can meet with God. Jacob was fleeing for his life when God encountered him. He was in a dark, depressed place, and he did not know God. And so if you feel like you're there, there's hope because God meets with you there. And so at this point, I, uh, the worship team is going to come back up, and we're going to have a time of response. And what I want you to do is I want to give you time this morning to go back. Go back to a place where you have encountered God. If it's the moment of your salvation, let's say maybe you have one moment or maybe you have lots of moments. Here's what I want you to do. Go back to the first moment you remember encountering God and give God praise there. Thank you, Lord, for that encounter. And then wait a second while the song is playing. It's going to be easier than you think it is. Wait a second and see if, the, if God gives you an action. Was there an action you were supposed to pick up? Remember, at each encounter, a lifestyle change took place. I sacrificed something, and I picked up something else. I laid down a part of me, and I picked up something in return. I picked up something from God. And so go back to a place of encounter. If it was salvation, if there was something else where God called you on a ministry, plan or he called you into a certain career path or whatever it is go back to that place and then give him praise for it okay so here's a couple of things number one maybe god has been speaking to you but you haven't responded and so you feel like you're on this christian journey but god's not really with you god is speaking but you need a moment of silence an encounter where you can hear him and then when you hear him you have to respond to him so maybe he's been speaking, but you haven't responded. And I want to give you that opportunity this morning to respond to the living God who speaks to you and loves you and has a good plan and purpose and future for your life. Number two, maybe God has spoken and you want to receive what he's saying, but you haven't laid down what he's asked you to lay down. If you don't lay it down, you can't pick up the next thing a lot of times. Okay? Number three, maybe God has spoken, but either you forgot what he said or here's the thing, you tried to fulfill God's promise in your strength. <laughs> That's never going to happen. So you got to go back. you got to go back to the place of encounter. you got to walk by the place and remember what God said. And then you do God's plan God's way. Okay? And then number four, maybe this is just a place of worship. You have been altered. You have those altar moments in your life. And so you want to go back to each one of them and just give God praise this morning. So what's going to happen is the worship team, they're going to play that song, Come to the Altar. If you've never heard it before and this is weird for you, just go ahead and sit and listen. That's perfectly fine. But if you want to respond to the Lord, the lights are going to dim. We're going to dim the lights for the worship setting. And what we're going to do is you, we call, this is a stage, a platform, whatever, but it's also called an altar. It's an altar. It's an it's a elevated place of, you can walk by this place. And remember, God spoke to me there, right there. So if you want to move and respond to God, you are welcome if you're comfortable to come to the altar and to remember that place of encounter, to lay something down and to pick something up. If you're less comfortable with that, go ahead and just turn around in your chair. Pretend like your chair is an altar. Turn around and kneel at your chair and let God speak to you. The point is respond. So whether it's bowing your head, coming to the altar, turning around in your seat, or just sitting there listening to the song, whatever it is, respond to the Lord this morning as the worship team sings the song. So we are having baptisms today. It's going to be so much fun. Uh, we're going we're gonna, to, this is how we're going to do it. The worship team's going to sing this song. You guys are going to respond to the Lord. And then I'm going to come back up and we'll switch to baptism. So please, nobody leave. Stay in your seat. Either listen to their song or respond to what the Lord would say to you this morning. Amen? Yeah.
said that, that we meet you or you find us, however it's worded, Lord, the fact of the matter is that the creator of the universe comes and meets with his creation. Lord, I am your creation and you come and meet with me. Lord, when I'm in despair or darkness or confusion or frustration, Lord, you are not far from me, but you are near to the brokenhearted and blessed are those who mourn. Lord, for we will see you, we will be touched by you, we will be met by you, Lord, we will meet with you. Lord, and so we give you praise this morning. Father, I thank you for each and every person uh, who's in the room and who's hearing this message. Father, I, I ask and I thank you for the reminder of the encounters that we've had with you. And I ask for more. Lord, that there would be a continual relationship and transforming power at work in our lives. We would do what your scripture says. That we would come and we would offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing. As, as a living sacrifice, worship to you. Lord, and that we would no longer be 
conformed to the pattern of this world, but we would be transformed in the renewing of our mind. Lord, we would pick up those lifestyle changes in order to, to walk out the plan and the purpose that you have for our life, sure and secure with an anchor steadfast in our soul that you are the provider. You are able. We can come to you in prayer. You are our peace.